here is it's, a, it's another status symbol in America. I'll just leave it at that. Um, I, I want to go back to this idea of sometimes you feel like you're not getting anything done that Sarah had said. A couple of years ago, the Green Paws Environmental Alliance put on an environmental fair here at NIU because they had the first uh, NIU film festival and I was talking to somebody about a person being on the green team and they said, oh, they're not on the green team. And I said, yes, they are. And it turned out there was two different green teams here at NIU. And the one did not know that the other one existed and vice versa. Okay. So we decided to put on this environmental fair, invite all the people that were working on these environmental issues. And lo and behold, neither of the green teams showed up to the environmental fair. So it can get frustrating sometimes, but then you have to realize there's things you're gonna do that are gonna work and things you do that don't work. And when you do something and it doesn't work, at least you knew you tried and you gave it a shot and now you know it doesn't work so you probably won't go back to doing that or you'll do it differently the next time. Uh, so I encourage people to try anything and everything, if you think you're going to get results from it, as long as it's legal, <laughs> per se. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, um, I just wanted to say something on the idea of planting native plants, uh, like Sarah was just talking about. Um, one other thing that people neglect to realize, sort of about environmentalism, and um, about native plants is that um, it can actually also help community-based issues. It doesn't have to just be an eco-tree hugger type thing. Um, those root structures, like she was talking about sort of revitalizing the water cycle, one thing that they do a great job of is sucking up water. Um, as opposed to turf grass, which the really short root system, it just sort of water pools up on the surface and you know it doesn't really go anywhere. Well, one huge issue with the Kishwaukee watershed is flooding. Because around the Kishwaukee River, we've planted so many grasses, and we've put down so much asphalt, that the water has nowhere to go. And for example, there's a trailer park in Sycamore, where last time we had a big rain, um, people couldn't get out of their houses, because water was literally up to, you know, about halfway up their doors because all around them was this grass and asphalt and you know they were in just a tiny little you know dip in the ground so they couldn't get out of their houses if we were to put in more natural tall grass prairies and um, more native plants and ecosystems um, flooding would be a much smaller issue so you can find a lot of times in things that um, could be construed as just something for the environment ways to also help the community I have a general question for everyone. What are uh, your views of cars using, you know, regular petroleum, bus, train, hybrid, and electric cars? Uh, first of all, I don't own a car. I ride my bike everywhere. So I'm kind of anti-car. <laughs> uh, I feel if you do have a car, though, you should get the most economically uh, fuel-efficient vehicle you you can own. And if you can't, and if you're kind of rationalizing, well, you know, I have this and it's paid for. Well, the next time you go out and buy a car, if you happen to be doing that, that you should make a decision like that using uh, public transportation. Uh, I lived in Chicago for quite a few years, and I took public transportation just about everywhere. Uh, and there's a lot of work to be done with young, bright engineers to create vehicles uh, to run on alternative uh, fuels and solar power on top of cars, hydrogen cells, things like that. That actually isn't my expertise. I'm not that smart. So uh, I like, I'm more of an organizer, and, but uh, I, 
just to, to, I guess, segue to that, to the whole bike lane issue here on, on campus is cars are very, very expensive to have insurance, to have to pay for the gas, to to pay for the maintenance, things like that. Uh, kids come to school, they have a car, they're carrying that, the insurance, everything else. By the end of the year, they're probably paying about four or five, maybe four grand for that car. That's about half their tuition here. They ditched the car and just came to school and rode their bike around, uh, save them a lot of money. And, and there's also issues of like parking here. There's nowhere to park on campus with your car. So people rack up all these parking tickets when they're here and then they go to graduate and then they can't graduate because they have all these back fines and parking tickets. <laughs> well, there's, there's a lot of work to do and I can go on and on about the car issue, but I'll just hand over the mic. I have some of those parking tickets. <laughs> um, um, yeah, like, so I actually commute, so I do drive my car um, th probably about three times a week here. I try to stay with friends when I can, but when I did live on campus, I did ride my bike everywhere. And that's one thing that's awesome about NIU's campus is that we have this totally free bike rental program available to all students. Are there enough bikes for all students? No. But um, it is an awesome program, you know, to encourage students to ride their bikes around campus. And we also have one of the best bus systems in the state next to the city of Chicago. So, you know, there is no need to have a car on campus. Like Eric said, even for the students that live off campus in apartments, you know, there's a bus route that goes right by there. There's a bus that goes to Walmart even. Um, so there is no reason to have a car on campus rather than if you need to drive home on the weekend. Um, I want to touch on flex fuel vehicles. So, um, at NIU we just got three electric trucks. Um, this is what the former chair of the green team, Jeff Hauer, calls sexy environmentalism. It's, it looks good, you know, it sounds awesome, ooh, electric trucks, but really is it making that big of an impact? Not really, because we're still using coal-fired power plants to get our electricity to power that car. So, and you know, unless you know we revolutionize some, you know, hydrogen-powered car, solar-powered car, you know, regenerative braking—that's awesome. Um, you know, but you know, our few electric trucks on campus, yeah, they're cool as like a symbol. They look nice, but in the end, they're not saving the university tons of money and fuel costs. Um, one thing I want to point out, uh, I know one of the student groups, the Environmental Studies Club that isn't here today, they are working on a biodiesel project here on campus. And this is something that Loyola University did successfully. Um, they started back in 2007. And what they did was they converted all their vegetable oil, all their fryer grease on campus, and they did this with um, collaboration between faculty, staff, chemistry students, environmental students, and business students, and they figured out a way to convert this leftover grease into biofuel. And now they use that as part of their fuel in their bus system on campus. Not only that, but Loyola University is now one of the only universities to be an authorized seller of this biofuel. Uh, biofuel. So these students had an idea, enacted it, and now it's making that group money. And now they're like a legitimate business selling this biofuel to other, you know, bus companies and other school districts. And they had such a successful program that now they're partnering, partnering with other universities such as Northwestern to actually take that grease from Northwestern now to be used in their products. So um, I think when we're talking with the idea of alternative fuels, you know, electric vehicles aren't really the way to go. Flex fuel vehicles, um, the idea of making biofuels from stuff that we would normally just throw away. I think that's the correct path we should be headed in. And you know, all these waste to energy processes, you know, that's more of you know what I'm interested in, and, and that's what I think.
think you know we should be focused on in research and studies and find better ways to you know make our waste into fuel in order to run these cars. And, you know, I'm sorry that I drive my car. <laughs> it gets 30 miles per gallon, but it is really old. And if I wasn't a broke college student, I would get something like a hybrid or Prius. But yeah, right now I need my car. <laughs> It did pass the emissions test, though. <laughs> um, let me just preface my speech by saying that I can one-up her. I drove uh, 20 minutes to get here, or no, more like 15 minutes to get here, in a car that definitely doesn't quite get 30 miles to the gallon, um, you know, as a high school student. But you're standing with choosers. Um, but as far as, you know, bikes and electrical vehicles go, bikes are obviously the optimal. You know, I mean, they don't require um, you know a fuel source other than you, and you know, so it's good for you too. So great partnership. Um, but as far as um, electrical vehicles go, one huge thing to consider when you're thinking about buying a vehicle is where did it come from and what's going to happen to it after you're done with it, because a lot of the um, a lot of the materials that they're using in batteries for new electric cars and hybrids are actually um, toxic or don't break down. So that'll, you know, once you're done with it, it's great because it keeps you from using fuel, but once you're done with it, that's gonna sit in a landfill forever. That's not gonna go away and we have no way of recycling it in its current form. Um, but as far as things like biofuels go, those are awesome because as Sarah was saying, they're a way to use something that we already, we didn't have a use for. It's a way to recycle things and, um, and prevent you know, the use of emissions. And electrical cars are going to be awesome when we figure out you know, a way to recycle you know, what we use to make them. Um, and once we get more sustainable fuel sources to get our electricity from, as opposed to things like coal plants or nuclear or oil, natural gas, uh, but until then, things like biofuels, I think, are definitely the way to go. Go for it, yeah. So, um, with biofuels around here, it's, um, the idea of ethanol is big, you know, growing corn to make ethanol for energy. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. We shouldn't be using agriculture to grow biofuels. Because look at how many fast food restaurants are around. Look at all the McDonald's and Burger Kings that use all this fire grease. Wouldn't it be awesome if there was some huge biofuel company and they had this big partnership with all these fast food restaurants and family restaurants to just take that grease and recycle it in fuel? That would be awesome. Why hasn't anyone done it yet? Like, who's got some money? Let's do it. <laughs> I'd like to touch on the subsidies, if I could. Uh, I work with the ICCAW, the Illinois Citizens for Clean Air and Water, here at, at, through NIU and uh, Dr. Thu, who's the chair of the anthropology department. And there's a reason that people don't grow corn in Mexico anymore. It's because it's subsidized so heavily in the U.S. that they can't afford to grow it because we grow it so cheap. We don't actually grow it so cheap, it's just subsidized by the government. And uh, also livestock is also subsidized by the government to grow corn to feed the animals, which they put into factory farms and because they have the animals so closed in, they have to pump up the feed with antibiotics so the animals won't get sick. And this is all leaching into our streams and rivers that actually goes down into the Gulf of Mexico. And we talked about the plastic island in the Pacific being bigger than the state of Texaco, I mean, uh, Texas. Uh, there's also a dead zone in the in the uh, Mississippi Gulf of Mississippi that's the size of New Jersey it is unoxygenated water. Fish cannot live in this water. It's all from the runoff of the subsidies 
from the subsidies from Illinois and these in, in Iowa and these these states around here. Uh, so a lot of times it goes maybe back to the water thing that it's it's big agriculture in Monsanto and these other companies that are advertising how good this is for us and. There's a lot of schools, as a matter of fact, the University of Illinois is a big agriculture school that's uh, full of bright students, but in my mind, they're working on all the wrong things. Uh, so it's, 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 it's our job to, to shed light on this governmental system that subsidizes corn the way it does here in America and on that note, I'd just like to segue is true environmental ed, environmentalism is really legislative type of work. You have to work uh, with legislators and, and, and uh, there's an Illinois Pollution Control Board, the EPA, all these different organizations that are basically in the back pocket of big ag and uh, it's going to take a lot of advocacy to change things. I don't see it happening too soon, but uh, things are changing slowly here at NIU because we just incorporated or uh, implemented the environmental studies program here at NIU. Uh, it's always been known as a business school to exploit resources and now we're starting to worry about conserving our resources. But this is just a small faction of the school. There's, a, there's, there's very few students that study environmental studies compared to the students that are in the business program. Uh, we have given the mic to the floor and we're giving the mic back to the floor. If you have questions or if you want to share some ideas. because 
what the government provided incentives for companies to put up plants to process biodiesel, so as well as encouraging farmers to to plant jatropha. The downturn is that it actually competed with food production where large tracts of land um, actually competes for, for example, rice fields are converted into jatropha, jatropha farms and this has some effect to the food supply of the Philippines which heavily relies on rice and of course, um, unfortunately, the Philippines is still considered as the largest importer of rice. So while there was this um, advocacy towards um, environmental uh, conservation and sustainable development, however, the challenges remains as to how these programs could go hand in hand with um, food supply and food production. Facebook page? Well, we 
of the internet nowadays, so that's pretty awesome. Um, a lot of our uh, our work on campus and in the community is done through social media. So we utilize Facebook and Twitter um, to communicate with each other and to communicate with people who aren't necessarily active in our group every day. So if one of the members has a cool event that they found out about, they share it with the rest of the group and those people hopefully share it too. Or if you find an interesting news story or you know, um, Eric shares a lot of his legislative progress all the time. And although I might not you know, comment on it, I still read it. <laughs> Yeah, to touch on that, uh, with the ICCAW, we are recognizing the linkages of these transnational corporations, such as PepsiCo, that is the biggest food conglomerate in the world, and ConAgra, and, and some of the different uh, conglomerate food companies like Smithfield Pork, that is actually owns probably about 75% of the well, they work out deals. They they have all these different names that people own. People own the pigs. People own the feed. People own the land. But it's all through the multinational corporation that basically they feed into and they have contracts with. So we're trying to expose, like, ConAgra owns perhaps maybe 150 different companies and and Nestle also, and, and PepsiCo, and under that umbrella, under that veil of those companies that they own, that to boycott them, basically. Uh, and to shop local, if you can, but also, you know, to do the, the no-name brand thing. Uh, in America, brand is another thing that's very status symbol, and, uh, and it's really hard for people that go shopping, uh, you know, to deal with this pester factor. Like, you know, you see it, mom, can I have this, mom, can I have this, no, no, no. And then on the seventh time they ask, yes, happens. And it's just like, we see that pattern that uh, people just give in because it's a lot easier to give in. Uh, so, just to not give in to going to Walmart and buying Kellogg's and buying all these other different brands, unless they're doing business correctly. Uh, we used to have Caribou Coffee in Sycamore slash De Sycamore slash Decal uh, line there. It was fair trade coffee. Uh, they didn't make it here in town. Starbucks is thriving. Starbucks does not sell fair trade coffee. Uh, people don't seem to care. We try, we try to raise awareness about this, uh, but it's, it's a really hard thing to do because the advertising, people buy into the advertising, people watch TV, they see the advertising, it's fashionistas, uh, I think have news, spring fashions, and 